Hi, everyone. Welcome to our show. And um, this is your three nerdy hosts. Uh, I'm Ginger Alex. and Alex <laughs> and David. OK, awesome. Yeah, uh, we really created this show, you know, to as a uh, container for our community members of both Make and Hackster to join and nerd out with us each month. Um, we're really excited for this episode, which is our episode three. Um, the previous one we did, um, it, uh, you know, uh, the, the first one we um, uh, we launched back in August and the second one was in October. We really have a lot of fun in just doing this shows with everyone um, and looking forward to continue, you know, each month to uh, uh, to give everyone a place to to hang out and nerd out. Um, so quick plug at the beginning of the show for both Hackster and Make, and I will make a, a uh, just to show what we actually do at Hackster, and if you already, if you're already kind of community members of both platforms, please bear with us. Um, but overall, you know, like Hackster, um, we are a uh, a community for hardware engineers to learn and, and and post their projects, you know, on for any of the, like, their creations um, that they that they have um, on the Hackster itself. Please, you know, visit all the channels we have. We have platform hubs that's based on different companies. We also have community hubs um, that's for different communities, schools, uh, nonprofit orgs, or hacker spaces, or any kind of like your uh, mini hackathons if you are uh, creating. And the topic page are for people to explore different um, topics. Um, we have always have like interesting, interesting things going on all the way from companion bots, all the way to like if you do PCB badges, or if you are into like um, upcycling cryptocurrency. And we're also looking forward to if anyone has new topic coming up, please pin us. Um, I'm actually the contest nerd at Hackster. So this, this contest page is what I run. And, and we enable these, you know, we have these three to four month kind of campaigns that enable people to win big prizes with these um, projects. Um, and, you know, there are lots of fun right now what we have. One is um, um, HMI, human machine interaction. So if you have any um, ideas about, you know, um, how to recreate a joystick or a keyboard, any kind of these uh, interaction things you know to communicate with a machine that's a really fun contest and there's another one uh, called the NXP hover games that's on drone and ro rovers and this year's uh, theme is about um, food sustainability so fun page to look over here and then um, our videos page you know please take a look has all of uh, Alex's, you know, creations, whether it's her <laughs> interview or she unboxing, those are really fun to watch. Um, definitely, you know, and follow us on YouTube. So that's a quick plug for our Hackster. Um, over here, you know, please subscribe to our newsletter. It's a weekly, it's a weekly newsletter that delivers, you know, the um, best Hackster news, you know, to your inbox and follow us on social. Ginger, when you were uh, sharing the different things on Hackster, it gave me an idea for, I'm going to attempt this, this might be our first three-way plug, uh, because uh, we are doing a, a Rebel Hackathon uh, this weekend uh, on Pebble smartwatches, uh, and we'll be posting those projects on Hackster, and uh, I'm saying that as the community editor of Make, so I think I just did a three-way plug, if that's, uh, if that's possible. <laughs> <laughs> um, back on to uh, make specific stuff. Um, we do a lot of things that make, but one of the most visible things that we do is uh, the magazine. Um, this just dropped volume 83, the annual boards guide, comes with a little pull out that uh, compares all the different uh, boards uh, that you can obtain at the moment, which is uh, kind of a limited subset. Um, but we talk about a bunch of microcontrollers, FPGAs, single board computers in there. Um, compare and contrast and highlight some, some special ones that we're excited about. And then we have coming up on December 1st, uh, our launch party for the magazine, uh, which is a virtual event similar to this one on Zoom. And we'll be talking about uh, a lot of the stuff from this magazine. So the boards, the chip shortage, um, and a lot of, uh, we had a lot of RGB LED uh, articles in this one as well. So we, we'll be talking about those things. We've got guests from Arduino, DigiKey, Lux Lavalier and a bunch of other independent makers. Um, 
So please sign up for that. Again, if you go to makezine.com, you can find all the information you need for that or just follow us on social. And uh, like I said, go to, go to make.co uh, slash join if you want to grab the magazine or subscribe to our newsletter or find us on social. And uh, I think that's enough plugging for now. <laughs> and I'd like to just quickly explain the structure that we have going here. You might have noticed that you came in through a lobby and that is going to be instrumental later on. So what we're gonna have first here is we're gonna have three amazing speakers uh, who get 10 minutes each to just sort of give an overview of either all of what they're doing or like one specific thing they've been nerding out on recently. I can't wait to see what a couple of these people have been doing lately. But uh, so 10 minutes each and there's a QA and a afterwards, panel Q&A for 15 minutes. And then we all go over to another session called the Hangout. This is the nerd out, that's the Hangout. Although I think we'll be nerding out in both places, honestly. Uh, but we'll go back to the lobby and then we'll scroll down and click on join session on the second session, the Hangout. And then everyone's gonna get to jump in and chat, video chat, uh, voice chat, or just text chat if you feel more comfortable with that. But the other really cool thing is that we have a giveaway from Seed Studio, which Ginger mentioned, and we are going to be giving doing a drawing for 10 people at the start of the second session, the Hangout. So not only will you be able to like chat with everybody, but also make sure to come over and join us for that second part. We'll give you instructions then, don't worry. <laughs> make sure to join us because you might win a Seed Shao, which is a really cool little board. Actually, do I have one right here? I think I have one right here. Um, anyway, it's somewhere on my desk. <laughs> They're a really cool, tiny little board from Seed Studio and um, super programmable, super cute and great for like wearable projects like some of these folks have got. David's got the hookup. I was just saying they're one of the featured boards in, in the board guide, so. <laughs> yeah. Bonus plug opportunity there. Oh it's so small. Yeah. Oh, really? So. Oh. And fun fact about Xiao, I was actually talking to the Seed Studio the other day. So Xiao in Chinese means small, like mm -hmm. literally means small, but it actually could also be interpreted as smile. Oh. Yeah. Oh. So most people interpret it, I think they design it as a shell for like oh. small, but mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, hey guys, you know, this actually can mean happy too. So that's so cool. Yeah, let's see, yeah. Well, hopefully so, we're going to be making 10 people happy in the second half of the show so yeah yes so be sure to join us we'll give you instructions don't worry about it uh but just so you know that's coming up and that's what we're going to be doing so let's uh bring in our speakers i yeah. think the way that we're going to do it is kelly then taylor then anuk is that right i think so and yeah anuk is here so we can start with anuk uh, i thought i'd give her a little bit more time to just yeah, get into the groove like but yeah Okay. okay, so we start with Kelly Taylor and Anuk. Sounds yeah. great. Uh, let, okay. me introduce, let me introduce Kelly then. Uh, Kelly Heaton is a cross-disciplinary -dis artist, artist, electrical engineer, and visionary of contemporary culture. She believes that electricity is the most important creative medium of our time and uses it to explore biological and artificial life forms. Her art combines electrical engineering with nature, spirituality, sculpture, painting, printmaking, design, and fashion. Heaton enlarges electronic devices to a human scale so that people can relate with circuits as a reflection of who we are. She also makes beautiful functional circuits that mimic songbirds and insects with an uncanny lifelike quality. Heaton aims to humanize tech culture and heal our relationship with nature through dialogue about the universal circuit in which we are all connected. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, David. Uh, thanks everybody for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Um, I've got a bunch of, so I'm actually not in my studio right now. I'm really fortunate to be dialing in from the Swiss Alps. I came over here for a couple of reasons, including Electronica, which is absolutely amazing. I don't know if anyone who's joining us was there, but I was just totally blown away by the technological complexity and I have now for more than 20 years, so my background is in fine art. So I did not come into this from an engineering angle. I developed that and it was very hard earned for me, but let's say 20 years ago, I decided, you know, electricity and electronics are completely changing the world. I need to know about this. And I, I went to the media lab and most of my colleagues were focused on software and I'm a bit of a contrarian anyway, but also to me, hardware had this sculptural uh, aspect. I could touch it. And 
it felt like the body and the soul of electronics and electronic devices. And I was like, that is where I'm going, you know, because software is this like thinking space and don't get me wrong. It's totally great, but I didn't see as much people working in hardware and that's where I wanted to go. So now, um, 20 years later, I'm making things like this. Uh, so this is, so excuse my wires. Um, but, uh, so this is a PCB in the shape of a bird with an analog electronic circuit that generates bird song. Um, I've got other uh, forms of that same idea uh, here. So again, totally analog electronic. It's all about the vibration. So I apply uh, DC power and due to the uh, oscillators that are coupled together in the circuit, it makes patterns and you hear it as bird song. I am gonna let you listen to it, but I wanted to show you these guys uh, first, just the different form factors um, that I've played with. And by the way, it's not just the form factors of the PCB, but also like I've spent now since 2018, I guess I started making printed circuit boards. A big part of it too was just figuring out like, what can I do, right? You know, if I'm going to have a, a, a PCB factory make this for me, how can I push the medium and get the most interesting, like visually compelling results? Here's a Here's a butterfly um, and, and just learning like the colors that you can get out of it and what happens when you put um, different, this is, this is a cricket, you can see that. Uh, what happens when you put uh, different color solder masks on different backgrounds and you use different surface treatments. And so I've spent a lot of time in the last couple of years experimenting with that. I'm gonna show you, um, I do, I promise I'm gonna let you hear a bird, but I wanted to show you one other big one I've got here with me. You can imagine what security thought about my suitcase. It's always very exciting. Um, so this is a recent piece I made. Sorry about my uh, camera light, but you see that mirror surface, right? It's just so beautiful, like what you can get out of a PCB. Um, this piece is 21 A-stable multivibrator oscillators with a, uh, uh, a sound with sound sensitivity, a microphone at the bottom. And so I basically in this in that piece, what I wanted to do was explore more of the spiritual qualities of electricity um, so that I'm making like a vibrating mesh. You know, I wanted it to feel like imagine if you like took a metaphysical microscope, right? And you like zoomed into the nature of reality, which we know is all frequency and vibration. And you could see things just like, you know, vibrating. Like that's basically what I wanted to, uh, to make. And I put the microphone in it because I wanted ambient sound to affect the vibration, but not change its character completely. So I didn't want it to be like a one-to-one -one relationship. Like I say something and, and the circuit goes, nah, you know, I wanted it to be more like the circuit had its own integrity as a mesh, but the sound would affect it. Cause that's really how reality works anyway. So um, yeah, so I'm super into spirituality and I love um, looking at the philosoph philosophical side of of things. Um, but so now, as I promised, the uh, bird circuit, this guy uh, is going to be my very first product in the market, which I'm really excited about. Sorry. Uh, there we go. So you can see the lights. I'm going to turn it on in a second. Um, but um, so he's called the night jar and it's got five A-stable multivibrator oscillators connected to a modified Hartley oscillator, which comes from the adapted canary doorbell circuit from like 1970 something. Um, and the entire circuit is analog. It's got a battery under the wing, speaker under the wing. You can look behind, there's really nothing back here. Just, just you know, art, you know, truth. <laughs> you know, birds aren't real. Sorry, I had to nod to that. But um, anyway, uh, so I'll turn it on. And and what's cool about this is that it uh, it generates bird song. You can adjust it with potentiometers here, so varying the resistance in the circuit and get different patterns. And for those of you who are into uh, uh, electronic sense, I put a stereo out jack. And I put an interface here so that you can control on and off of the oscillators remotely. So you can actually like play the bird. So here we go.
So anyway, oh. Kelly, your sound's coming through for you because we're not hearing them on this side. Yeah. Darn it. You know what? Like, you know what that is? That's not, Zoom. It's not, yeah. It's is not it doing the noise point. reduction? Yeah. It's doing the, ah, yeah. when Zoom yeah. hears something that's not human, it's like, oh. Yeah, eh. It filters out non-voice frequencies. I think you can change like that in your audio settings. Or whatever. Because can I change it? Okay. Well, you know what? So let's do this. If you want to. <gasps> Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't want to go digging around in my audio settings right. right now, but for those of you who would like to hear the bird, well, so two things. First of all, you can hear it on my social media. However, secondly, uh, I will hang on to it. And when I'm no longer on screen, like holding people up, uh, I'll fuddle around. I'll, I'll look if at my settings. If so. it's easy, Kelly, there's just a thing right at the top of your screen right now. It says original sound for musicians. If you turn that to on, that should do it, I think. On the top of my screen, original you sound. Don't, see it, for don't musicians. worry about it. Let's just let's just keep going. I'll, yeah, I'll not seeing it. Yeah, sorry about that. No problem. Anyway, how much time do I have? Good question. Um, three minutes. Three minutes. Okay. So anyway, so yeah, so the bird that you can't hear, but whatever. <laughs> anyway, um, so but I've been like, so I am a fine artist, and most of the work that I make is originals and and uh, very time consuming, which is expensive, and I can't really offer that to you know the, a broader community at a at a, a at a price that like most people can afford. So I am excited. I've started a new brand called Circuit Icon. And you guys are going to start to see some things coming out from me under the brand Circuit Icon, which will allow people to buy my boards at a more affordable price. So they won't be like, you know, fine art, high top, you know, additions. They'll be more, yeah, accessible. So this guy's going to be produced by Adafruit and possibly a European manufacturer. Uh, we're going to try and keep it in its complete done soldered form under $150. And uh, and then I've got other boards, too, that I'm working on, um, like this one. Uh, I've also uh, been generating a circuit icon version of that. So, like, I just want to make my board designs available to people. Um, and, yeah, uh, let's see. What else do I do? Um, I'm also into fashion. This is my resistor pack. I'm, I'm looking. I'm trying to figure out how to manufacture and sell these, too. So this would also be circuit icon. So everybody can go around with their resistor pack. Um, I'm dressed like a resistor. I don't know whether I'll like be selling this kind of stuff, but my cap, if I, I'm working on figuring out how to make caps so people can like, you know, do the whole bipolar thing <laughs> or yin yang. <laughs> anyway, um, gosh, anything else you want me to address David while I'm up well, here? Got about a minute left. I just want to let you know, people are freaking out in the comments about, um, <laughs> about the hat, about the clothes, everyone is oh, loving good. that. So These are awesome, aren't they? I love this pack so much. Like you wear it, you wear it across your body like this. So it's it's super comfortable and I wanna do it in a bunch of different stripes. And I'm, oh, I'm looking into doing it in uh, all vegan mushroom leather, like keeping it like super ecological. Any ideas on how to how to make that happen? I would love to hear it. Awesome. Well, uh, check out the comments uh, after after this because people are freaking out and love it. And uh, thanks so much, Kelly. I think we're going to hand you. it over to uh, Ginger for her introduction now. Yeah. Um, our next nerd is Taylor. Um, let me pull up Taylor's intro. Uh, Taylor Hokuson is an artist, academic, open hardware advocate, and noted tall person. So I am super curious actually how tall Taylor is. I've never actually met him in person, you know, but we came across, you know, like through through a network. So so yeah, tell us, you know, like to Taylor, you know, like how, how tall you are, you know. And, and he's an early participant in the maker movement and investigates the promising problematic nature of uncritical technology consumption in the post-digital landscape. Um, and principal among these are like human computer interaction, computer aided fabrication, um, some of you will see, you know, probably he'll introduce and new models for collaborative authorship and content distribution. So humor and absurdity brings accessibility and fun to uh, his projects, um, but also technically um, alienating topics. For example, his controlled feeding status is a set of 3D printed silver flatware that embodies the first world's queasy relationship with food. 
Each fork in the series is covered with a uh, progressive accumulation of tumor-like growth, offering implementations that impede the eating process to different degrees. And the work is presented on a velvet bed inside a fancy wooden box. Hmm. So, um, yeah, and for that, it's um, a blend through technically nutritious food products served on some American and served in some American prisons as punishment for misbehavior. So also, you know, just lots of uh, interesting concepts that explored through hard work and welcome Taylor. I think I'm unmuted. Thanks, teacher. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, great. So you sound uh, amazing. I'm jealous. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm dialing in from uh, Chicago, where I'm the associate chair of art and design at Columbia College Chicago. But I'm also an independent artist, uh, an engineer. I do uh, consulting around uh, art and education, so have my uh, my finger in a lot of pies. Uh, I suppose I could start out uh, talking about that piece that uh, Ginger was talking about. So maybe I'll share my screen. Uh, so if you check out my website, it's taylorhokinson.com. And uh, the first thing we were talking about there, controlled feeding status is kind of a good example of my uh, sense of humor. So I was reading about this court case that was brought by, I believe, inmates in Illinois. And of course, one of the things we Americans are famous for is our uh, bizarre prison system and our relationship to food. So it turned out that if you had somebody in prison and you were running out of ways to punish them, one way to do that was to feed them food that was technically nutritious, but really effectively disgusting. And so in the court case where the inmates were arguing that the food was so gross, it constituted cruel and unusual punishment like torture, you could actually get the Department of Corrections recipe for how Nutriloaf is made. So if you take a look here, Pretty much the only thing that offers any flavor is the ounce of tomato paste and garlic powder. And that's <laughs> that's the only two seasonings. Uh, everything else, you know, by itself is not that big a deal in a regular context. So if I'm sitting at home and I mixed all this stuff together and cooked it, you know, you can eat it. It just takes like gross bean dip, basically. And I've eaten it. Uh, but in the context of prison where there's so little to look forward to on a day to day basis and so little of a way to experience joy or connect to your humanity. It's a really big deal. So ultimately the government ruled that feeding somebody nutritious, gross food was not torture. It was technically constitutional. So it continues to this day um, around the United States. So, so when I made this piece, I have here an etched brass recipe card. Uh, that's my wife's handwriting because it's much better than mine. And then uh, here's the uh, fancy wooden box that Ginger was referring to. I, I had these forks uh, 3D printed in wax and then lost wax cast into uh, sterling silver so they could have that kind of precious aspect. Um, another thing I like to point out too is that when I was carving down the walnut to make this box, I exposed a bullet or a slug of some kind that must've been shot into a tree 50 years ago, 100 years ago, who knows? So as I was cutting the wood with the, uh, the miter saw, I cut the bullet in half and then it came shooting out of the wood and hit me in the cheek. <laughs> and so, you know, you, you kind of can't plan this stuff, but um, I was already making work about the carceral state uh, and I wound up getting getting shot in the process. It was, was uninjured, but I, I kept the little bullet and it sort of presented uh, next to the artwork on a little, a little uh, plexiglass dish. So, you know, this is a, a good example, I think, of a piece that tackles a couple things that are very serious in terms of food and incarceration, but also does so with humor. And I think part of the seat of the humor is spending that much time and effort on something so non-functional. And I think I heard this in our, our earlier artist statement. Uh, I think all three of us probably are investigating the limits of what function is. So, you know, you might take a PCB and show it to an engineer and they might say, you know, I don't know, like, is it a susceptible to interference or is it as um, cheap to make as possible based on the results we're going for, whatever it happens to be. And I'm really interested in, in pulling away on those um, engineering concepts and those market-based concepts and trying to move over to, um, as Neil Gershenfeld would say, a market of one. You know, if we're making this for this like conceptual experience, how does the value proposition change? Uh, so there's, in terms of, whoops, don't wanna log into my, what have I done? Okay, let's get back out to my website here. So in terms of things that I'm currently really interested in, 
uh, one big piece has been developing this uh, sculpture called Fine With This, which is a not so veiled reference to the This Is Fine meme of the dog sitting in the kitchen with the house on fire. And the collaborators I was working with, Jay Stephen Lee on the West Coast and Kay Dart, who's out of Shepherd University, we were trying to come up with a piece that could address all of the crazy stuff that's happening on a daily basis. So the world's kind of in crisis constantly. And we were wondering, can we make a work that can address the constant world is on fire crisis? And that would be sort of evergreen. So we could take it to different exhibitions and have it focus on, say, the presidential election or you know a military coup or the Iranian protests or whatever it happens to be. And we went a little literal by deciding we would make an object that was actually on fire. So this is one of our uh, prototypes here. This is a cast iron form that's hollow in the middle that's been plumbed with propane and that's running propane more or less like a barbecue grill would. Uh, for anyone that's interested in the technical back end, I can certainly answer questions about that too. So this was all developed in Rhino and Grasshopper uh, based on these little Truchet tiles. And if I take a look here at the Find With This website, which is just findwiththis.site. You can see here some examples of the thing on fire, but if we get a little closer, you can see that Truchet tile gives this really nice kind of generative uh, surface to the whole thing. So this piece, as it wound up, it's about three by three feet. Uh, it's a little hard to figure out where to show it because a lot of exhibition spaces are a little shy about things being on fire. Uh, and so in a lot of cases, when we were starting out, we actually, our main exhibition was through Twitch. So we got a Twitch account, we would stream the piece working, and then there's this whole sort of Raspberry Pi API backend that lets people dial in through Twitch and leave coded comments in the comment section. And those comments would cause the piece to get an extra burst of propane. So there'd be like a big three foot fireball that would, uh, would jump out of this thing. Uh, yeah, so then we sort of, it, it was kind of a, um, an artwork for the COVID age, but now we've been starting to show it in more concrete spaces. So most recently last month, I was at a Curie Blast Furnaces for the Festival of Combustion, again, kind of on the nose, but they were into it. And so we, uh, we bought a bunch of ingredients for s'mores, and then we invited people to donate money and then come cook s'mores on the surface of the piece. And then while they were doing that, we donated all of that money. We redonated it to a local library. Uh, we've also worked to build up a scholarship for queer identified people to go to future that's a mouthful. Queer identified people to go to future iron casting conferences. So if you fall into those two categories, queer identified, and you're interested in attending iron casting conferences in the next year, reach out to me as well. And I can direct you towards, uh, towards that scholarship. And then I think finally, you know, at the moment, uh, you guys have to tell me how I'm doing on time, but I've been really getting interested in building community as art making. And I guess you could kind of call that relational art, but I never really went for that term. I just like getting together with a bunch of cool people and making stuff happen. So this was at Logan Square in Chicago. I organized a big aluminum metal pour. So artist Eric Fuertes, who I work with in Chicago, he brought out his furnace that he built himself. You know, we, we sort of gathered a little bit of money here and there, uh, including from this art space comfort station. And then we invited people to make scratch blocks, right? Where you take a, a block of resin bound sand and scratch a pattern into it and then pour the results uh, into a sculpture. So in some cases, you know, I'm working with high technology where um, you got to go on Twitch and there's this API and yada, yada, yada. And then in other cases, I'm really looking at super ancient technology like metal casting that's been around for thousands of years and community building, uh, but really enjoying the way that uh, we're coming off of COVID and everyone's just so hungry for community and to be together. And uh, that's why I'm really enjoying doing, um, doing events like this that we're doing right now. Thank uh, you, Tater. Yeah, did that feel like a natural amount of time? Yeah, no problem. That yeah, sounds good. Yeah, that we were like right, you know, like on time. And so thank you so much. And I'm pretty um, pretty sure that we'll have lots of, you know, nerd question for you later on combustions, on fires and all these kind of stuff. And Perfect. so, uh, but yeah, let's, um, um, thank you, Taylor. Oh, and before I forget, I should give a shout out to the Flaming Lotus Girls who really got us started on yes. that technological backend. Yeah. They are so cool. Sure. Are. Bay Area. <laughs> okay, I am way too excited to introduce Anouk, so uh, let's get her on here, and I'm going to embarrass her. 
<laughs> so just getting started here, Anoka has a background in uh, couture, interaction design, and electronics, and she combines them to build works at the intersection of interactive couture, wearable devices, and smart textiles. And I'm just going to pull up pull some, some of, oh, we've got a little bit of an echo. There we go. Okay, so I just want to show you guys, uh, this is her website, I'll put it in the chat. Um, you can see she's done these collaborations with incredible companies, Google and Microsoft, Autodesk, Audi, Intel, Swarovski, like, yes, Audi, the company, and check it out. Uh, like, I was looking for some pictures to show y'all, uh, and her probably her most famous piece that you might know of is the spider dress. You can see some pictures there, but, like, just looking for an article on this, uh, you know, you find the New York Post, CNBC, NPR, uh, she's just, like, an incredible person who's been fe featured all over the place. And I wanted to show you a few of her uh, projects just in case she doesn't get to them. Some of my faves, uh, of course, I got to show this collaboration that uh, she did with Haxter on the light up kitty ears. This is all in a, she made these cool PCBs and this kitty ear headband that you can actually make. It's all open source. Go make it. It's adorable. Um, she built fashion <laughs> tech for Fergie at the Super Bowl. Look at that. It's like LED shoulder pads and these cool light up boots. Um, she did a collaboration with Arc Attack where she got struck by lightning in a dress that she made out of chain mail. <laughs> and then uh, she's also been working on this EEG device, the Unicorn Hybrid Black, for developers, for makers and stuff. And uh, I'll drop these other links in the chat so that you can go explore after we watch her talk because this person is amazing. All right, take it away, Anuk. <laughs> Oh my God, you're you're uh, you're really cute. Uh, that's really sweet. That's a that's a really great introduction. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, at the last moment, I heard that we had a show and tell, which I didn't um, uh, like um, took anything for. But I want to show my puppy because we have Lumi in the. Um, I'm gonna show you my puppy. Oh and my gosh. And I'm still making a little spider dress for her, but uh, so that is my show and tell moment uh, for this uh, for this well. And the other thing what I want to do is I'm gonna uh, share my screen to show some things um, and pull this up. And I think I will be heading away for a little bit, but um, yeah, Alex, um, yeah, yeah, you already told me a lot of things about me, so you can find me uh, online. I do, uh, yeah, cool stuff with electronics. I've been doing that for the last uh, 22 years. I always say that I started when computers were really big, so the, the science looked uh, cute from the front, but you turned around and there was this really uh, big computer on the back, which was not super handy. So um, yeah, through uh, working with like a small microcontroller, small computer board, um, it's super easy now. Arduino did a really cool thing, of course. Um, and just any all the electronics being so small that it can be really easily uh, integrated on the body, sort of. So what I do is I use uh, body sensors. I'm sensing the body. So from brain signals, I did projects with heart rate, uh, EMG, uh, galvanic skin response, all of that. Um, I also sense the, the, yeah, the surroundings. So for example, I look at the spaces that we have around us, like the intimate space, the personal space, the social space, the public space, and all these spaces have certain dimensions. So this is the proximic theory by Edward T. Hall in the 60s. He was measuring people's personal space with a stick, like a wooden stick. I use uh, ultrasonic rangefinders. I'm using um, proximity sensors and such to do these readings. And in one of my projects, you can um, find find this into fruitation. I can never pronounce this word, but um, it's um one of my projects, the spider dress, it works on proximity sensor. It measures up to 25 feet and it senses when people step into these spaces. So when uh, somebody steps in a personal space, for example, um, it starts to react. It literally starts to attack uh, you because uh, the whole design is based with servo motors. So I have basically an, uh, a black uh, plexiglass uh, version and also this 3D printed one that you can see here. So it's basically like an animatronic dress that uh, reacts when people step into its uh, personal space. So this is uh, basically the back, uh, the back part, uh, the sensors are in the front, everything goes into the back piece, uh, the servos, Hobby King servos, 939 servos that make the system move, uh, so everything is like a mechanic. Another dress of mine is um, a smoke dress. 
Um, it is a dress that um, doesn't work on a, a personal space, but it measures the amount of people in the direct space around this dress and it reacts to that. Uh, the more people that are in the direct environment of this dress, the more smoke uh, comes out and is based on uh, another animal like the octopus or the inkfish, we call it in the Netherlands. It pushes out ink so it can uh, basically escape, it can dive away. Uh, that's a fully 3D printed dress uh, that uh, we created in like 2010 when the SLS printers were coming in. So selective laser sintering. So it's created from PA12 and TPU. So the frontal piece is rubber, a thermoplastic polyurethane. And um, here you can see it smoke in my uh, in my old studio. So it's kind of a cool dress, uh, mainly because I can always uh, see where the models are going uh, because you see this big plume of smoke. So I can never lose them sort of. And so you can uh, you can find some videos online. Um, yeah, the whole uh, piece uh, was created in Maya using Maya. Uh, the smoke goes into the hip area, is being turned around and then pu being pushed out of the PA uh, twelve um, over the SLS uh, process, which I'm sure. You guys know, so I'm not going to show that. Um, one of my other dresses is a uh, robotic uh, cocktail making dress. So it makes you uh, little shots of cocktail. <laughs> so it's based on a peristaltic pump. Uh, the wearer is pushing the button and basically the peristaltic pump starts to turn and pushes the liquids to the front. So that's kind of a more simple design, but it's pretty effective. And um, it does it really well on events and parties and all of that stuff. I created that for Cirque du Soleil when I was working for their restaurant in Ibiza. Um, so that's the back piece the peristaltic pump and here you can see one of the dresses walk around there they're in gold and in pink and uh, some others so yeah i have more than um i think 80 or 90 different dresses and they all do something different um that i've been creating over the last 20 years um and yeah for me it's really the question like if and when we put technology on the body what does it do how can it become like more social more playful like the cocktail dress um, how can it become defensive and behavioral like the spider dress or how can it become uh, almost like expressive and emotive like um, for example the uh, the smoke dress so really seeing fashion as an interface so yeah that is what i've been uh like working on you can find many more projects online what uh, alex already showed um and uh yeah for me it's just really fun next to that i do a lot of teaching um i try to get more girls into um electronics uh through uh like uh, sort of leapfrogging them into to <laughs> um like fashion the fashion elements uh, a lot of girls might be interested in electronics but not through uh, mm -hmm. electric cars or windmills like i am sort of but a lot of girls are interested in fashion and um, sometimes that fascination into electronics can come by uh, yeah, creating robotic dresses and all of that stuff. So uh, I'm always trying to do things like uh, the Hexer thing that we did with, uh, with Alex, putting the electronic kitty ears online, uh, doing a lot of uh, workshops with uh, children and, uh, and girls, uh, getting them into electronics over Arduino or whatsoever sort of, or into 3D printing. Uh, because yeah, it's just, um, I think, yeah, the world of electronics is just really fascinating. And I love, uh, yeah, as, as most people to to explore this and to also yeah be inspired to work with electronics as well because it's just uh, really fun so yeah um if you have any questions on sensors to use or you're doing any kind of electronic uh, product you can always um i'm gonna email you my uh, put my email address in the uh, in the chat so you can always ask me questions about hey i'm doing this project uh, what kind of sensor should i use or something like that so feel free to uh, email me as well and that's it Sweet, thank you. Ah, oh, what a cool thing. There's so many amazing dresses that Nook has built. So let's bring everybody in here now. It's time for our 15 minute panel Q&A. And just to remind everybody, there's a button at the bottom of your screen uh, where you can submit questions for the Q&A or you can drop them in the chat. We'll be monitoring both. And uh, after this 15 minute Q&A, we will then all shift over to the hangout session where everyone can talk and we'll do the drawing. Okay, so we have a first question from Patricia Dooley who says, Anouk, what are some lessons learned in making these wearable art pieces? Yeah, what would you tell Patricia? Um, I think a lot of like experimenting, um, make sure that your comfort is really well, uh, try out like different uh, materials. What I really like is, uh, I just got these prints in actually, uh, I forgot to show those. 
So you can work with like um, hard things. This is like a, a Mac piece, but I um, I, uh, I just did it out of TPU, uh, which uh, I just shot off as an experiment sort of, and it actually worked out really well. It's for like a uh, product in a restaurant and it's uh, like really flexible. Uh, so sometimes like, yeah, experiment because uh, sometimes you do something and you think like, oh, this might be cool. And it worked out really well because my pieces sometimes they're like really hard. <laughs> Um, I like to print it out of TPU uh, in this case. So do sometimes the unexpected uh, and let that surprise you. <laughs> Interesting. So a lot of the pieces that you've printed are rigid and I uh, assume that there was like a lot of design that went into that. And I guess it turns out that that's because they're very complex to print. So um, yeah, sometimes for mechanic pro properties, especially if you're using things that need to be accurate in, in terms of like animatronic and me mechatronics, you might want to use um, harder things for the precision, uh, the place in space, what we call it in robotics, sort of. Um, so that that's mostly my reason to do it more hard, like the spider dress. But um, I do like the approach of like soft robotics and all of that stuff. But it's the compromise of having that accuracy, I guess. Yeah. What about you other folks? What kind of tips would you give to beginners? That was fascinating, by the way. <laughs> I mean, one thing I get thinking about I know uh, Kelly mentioned, were you talking about Ars Electronica that you just came back from, Kelly? Uh, no, Electronica. Electronica, mm -hmm. the conference I was in. Munich. Okay, got it. Got it, got it. Yeah. The, um, it. It got me thinking about, I was out at uh, Ars Electronica, I think in 06, and processing and Arduino were really just starting to make oh. a bigger impact. And I remember seeing those and thinking, ah, eh, that's, ju that's just a fad. <laughs> but, I, but I think that, uh, wow. you know, when we were starting, um, it was so much harder to get online and find obscure information. And now there's just so many groups of people that are so excited about sharing what they know. So I just really encourage everyone to support that kind of open source aesthetic. And I mentioned the Flaming Lotus Girls. So I reached out to them and just said, hey, I wanna do something kind of like what you're doing. Are you willing to share information? And they sent me schematics and they sent me suppliers and all sorts of things. And they were just excited to do it. And so, um, yeah, I think just take advantage of that spirit and then go go find the people and tell them to help you out. And they usually will. Yeah, I, I would like to add to that. I think it's absolutely critical. We live in a time of such immense complexity. It's way beyond anybody. So the last thing any of us should think is that we're not smart enough or we don't have enough energy or something's wrong with us. I mean, I, there nobody can keep up. And I think it's so critical that artists shift into a mode of sharing broadly and being extremely supportive of each other because it isn't the um what did i hear someone in a spiritual community told me that um that the you know we now enter the age of aquarius the previous age was about knowledge this age is about experience so it's not about like what you know because like there's just so much right everybody needs to know everything it's what you do with it it's the experience you make of it so that that's you know nobody needs to be like trying to reinvent the wheel anymore mm -hmm. so kelly i have a question for you um i was looking around my office before we got started and grabbing a bunch of sort of PCB art that I have around here, some of it by some of our uh, on-staff nerds here. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, a lot of these though are sort of simple, you know, maybe they maybe they light up or blink or something, um, but your stuff kind of goes to a whole different level. And I'm curious, are you, um, do you have an artistic vision and you're using electronics to kind of enable that? Or is it the other way around? Or is it both? Or is it something else? Or all these uh, absolutely it's the artistic vision first however as many of us artists know all too well that if you drive in that way unless you've got like a lot of money and a fabulous team of engineers who are exquisite communicators you're going to slam into a brick wall <laughs> so <laughs> you know as with all forms of art you've got to work with your medium I mean, nobody says like, I'm going to make a painting. It's going to look exactly like this. You know, it's like you work with the medium and you get where you're going. Electronics, electricity, it's all the same way. However, I would add, at least for me, you know, coming from my fine arts background and being much more of a, you know, I'm a right brain, left brain person, but I, I really am a very intuitive person. Like I consider myself very artistic in that temperament. And when you're dealing with a medium like electrical engineering that's so rule-based, Ooh, man, you know, a lot of explosions, a lot of bad <laughs> smells, a lot of, you know, pulling my hair out, like, 
Wow. Yeah. Uh, that's also why I'm so keen on sharing, right? Because if I figure out a circuit, I'm like, okay, everybody, here you go, right? <laughs> Let's move on. That was hard because that's not the art. That's the, I mean, it is right where we are now. Yes, that's the art, but let's just keep going. I have a bit of a follow-up question. So with regard to the PCB specifically, I feel like that I'm seeing a lot of advancements in the community in terms of like how silk screen and is used and how copper is manipulated to make different colors and stuff. Any sort of specific tips or tricks that you've found in terms of, you know, getting more colors out of a PCB and things like that? Yeah. Uh, think like a screen printer. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's really what you're doing. Basically, you've got to think in layers. Uh, I use Photoshop. Well, I also use Illustrator. Uh, but once I've got my traces designed, I use KiCad for that. I will bring them in as layers in Photoshop. Of course, you know, any layered graphics program will work. But so keep every layer separate. And the other uh, habit that I form is um, I have one layer where it's like black and white and that's the art. That's my print layer. That's where I'm like, my, my film comes from that. So like the Gerber comes from that. But I also make a version of that layer that looks like what I think it's going to. Now you have to be careful with this because with your solder mask, it's the inverse, right? Like wherever you have solder mask, you're not gonna get solder mask. Don't make that mistake. <laughs> I've done it so many times, it's expensive. But anyway, so yeah, like uh, good file management. But yeah, you can pretty much simulate a board completely in Photoshop before and know what it's gonna look like. Perfect. I'm just typing in the chat. I actually just published a tutorial with a similar workflow on the iPad, also using layers in Procreate. So I'm just good. gonna drop yeah. it in here, uh, not to hijack, but I have a question for all y'all. So, um, you all play with uh, different sort of levels of communication with other people. I feel like Kelly, a lot of your stuff feels kind of introspective and like dealing with your personal spirituality. And Nook, a lot of yours is about intimacy and like pushing away or inviting people in or like changing, you know, with the drink bot dress, it's kind of about like uh, changing someone's uh, way of interacting with other people. And then Taylor, yours is often about kind of delivering a message or like speaking about something specific. And I wonder, you know, you each also sort of exhibit in different ways. There's like demos, galleries, uh, you know, events and like having people ex like walk around in them. And I wonder how like your sort of the, the central ideas of your art um, affect how you choose to display them and share them with the world. Also, you all publish them as tutorials. So. I'm having a little trouble narrowing down so are you, are you talking about like like <laughs> methods of distribution or methods of distribution or how you choose to like show your art and share it with people uh, sure. uh any way we can <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it was a terrible question i'm sorry <laughs> well, no we, we're getting there i mean i think so for example i i made this piece um man i think like 15 years ago now or something that was just a, i took a keyboard and soldered wires out of a, a like ten dollar USB keyboard, and then cast these big uh, one kilogram silicone keys. So I made like a six foot wide keyboard oh. for writing, and you have to operate it with a with a mallet. And so the first place I showed that was in Rogers Park in Chicago, and this was right around Hurricane Katrina. So somebody walked up to write on it, and then uh, wanted to write an anti George Bush message, right? The president at the time, and they had to ask us how to spell George Bush. And so, you know, clearly this was somebody that did not engage in writing ever, it, and nor I think probably politics if they were unaware how to spell that simple name. But, you know, if you'd left a regular keyboard out on the street and invited people to use it, nobody would have cared. So in this case, making it harder to use and also more specific really inspired people that I wasn't necessarily targeting explicitly. So I think one of the things I try to do is to make work that's kind of unfinished until the audience component comes and finishes it. And then the audience tells me, oh, we're interested in politics, so we're interested in typing a bunch of swears or whatever it happens to be. But that's that's so much more rewarding than me going and saying, I have a question and an answer, please just absorb it. 
Yeah, I think I think that's part of being an artist to have some uh, statements out there, but uh, maybe a little bit more fakely, and they can be uh, interpreted uh, by uh, by sort of the broader audience. I really like that. Um, like myself, I look a lot at behaviors. For example, I make uh, wearable robotics, right? But how can the robots that we produce are mostly modeled after humans? So how can they have more an animalistic behavior? For example, you know, the spider dress uh, almost reacts like a cat. You know, if you come close to a cat, you get a claw. You know. So it's an it's an spider spider based wearable robotic dress that acts like a cat, right? So how can you make hybrids? And then how can you put that out into people and then see their reaction to that sort of you know because they sense that hybridism uh, of of this this robot being a hybrid of of many things sort of you know. So that's how, mostly how I approach it. Cool. Actually, hey, just to thought. Yeah, Kali, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, how, I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I have so many ideas. I, I have so much inspiration and I'm so, I, I'm just such a creative person that uh, I, I don't know. It's like, I'm sometimes art really takes over my life. Um, I feel art, art is how I process all the information that comes to me. So, I oftentimes like don't even have time to pause and think about what my strategy is. I guess I've been for the last 20 years, I just feel like everything is changing in society so rapidly that it's my job as this creative channel to like process that for the collective. And in my in my case, I've been really trying to grapple with what electricity means as a creative medium and and showing showing people like how everything is a circuit, like nature is a circuit, humans are circuits, we're all circuits. So that's like kind of a healing knowledge but also to be like hey like come on you know electronics and technology uh doesn't need to be so dystopian and cold like let's push more of a human softer agenda i would even say feminine agenda when i use that i mean archetypally feminine i do not mean gender i mean like just nurturing receptive natural uh connected right so yeah but man i'm like I, I don't have enough hours in the day to even begin to think about all the things I want to make. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to I want to kind of like follow up on Alex's uh, question in terms of uh, just the community building, right, and in, inspire others. And I think you know all of you all do it in like a, a different way in trying to make your art more accessible uh so i know you know inspiring girls uh kelly you know like make the, the your whole new brand is trying to make it more low cost so people can can also experience it themselves and taylor do the uh, community building aspect and um i've been recently like traveling in indonesia and really under like really experience it like my myself personally in just terms of knowledge and accessibility to 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 technology is very different than you know like like us or i was you know in china and um so me personally i'm also trying to 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 think about how to make that kind of accessibility more actually across the globe. And when I say globe, right, you know, it's not just Europe, you know, like America or like even China, Japan, like more advanced countries, but in like other emergency, emerging like economies that they have like a lack of just access. And wonder, you know, what's your thought on, on that? I met a French musician yesterday. He said, and he makes these um, instruments to simulate the traditional Indonesian gamelan music. And uh, he was saying that, you know, like, I'm from France, you know, but people who can afford to go to uh, Paris opera, you know, are only small segment of the society. And I want to bring my art to the community. So I find French countries to go play my music at, you know, I would like investing those. So that was like really inspiring. And I'm just wondering, you know, what your thoughts are on this? And we only have one minute left, so we could actually continue on um, that, you know, that conversation when we go to the um, the other awesome. nerd session. Yeah, but maybe maybe to right, we should stop here and shuffle. shuffle real quick, uh, um, oh. just before before we have too many other people talking, Kelly, can you try the bird sound real quick and see if we can have? Oh yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. I think. Tell me. There yeah. you go. Okay. <laughs> yes. I turned original sound for musicians on, and I think that helped. Oh, that might be a thing that you have to tell them. Sound. So. 
sad. <laughs> anyway. So yeah. naturalistic. It really sounds like bird song. Yeah. Well, yeah, and what's really interesting is because it's analog, it's not only when you change the resistance, it's not only changing the resistance in the circuit, it's also when you change it according to how much charge there is on the capacitors. And so it's just kind of, it's, it's pretty wild, actually. And I also included in this bank uh, down here where you can control the on off of the, um, you can turn on and off which ones are coupled. And I also included three slots where you can add your own circuits. So you can add more oscillators. You could add, somebody asked about a CO2 sensor. I don't know, just add whatever and see how like weird results you get. I mean, I'm curious. I don't, yeah, I'm just curious to see how people play with it. One other thing real quick, somebody asked me about I'm trying to type and it's just taking too long. Two uh, colors, solder mask, not all board houses will do that. Some will. Uh, I really love a board house named King Creedy for their willingness to do small jobs. King Creedy, really, really good people. You can ask for Spring. She's my sales rep. So that's a plug for them. And there's another board house that does two or three uh, solder mask colors. And I'm digging around in my phone to find it. So I will post it. All right. Well, it's time to switch over. We're going to switch from the webinar format to an, an open format um and we're gonna do the drawing room, room where we'll also <laughs> really be giving that, away our 10 prizes so we will see you on the other side uh feel free to ask questions in the chat if you're having trouble getting over there <laughs>